Now that we've rationalized behaviors of gases based on interactions between gas molecules, let's spend a little time looking at such interactions in more mathematical detail. So the virial expansion I presented to you as a given, and uh, it comes from statistical mechanics, and statistical mechanics in a bit more depth than we would want to do for a course that focuses on thermodynamics. But it derives from knowledge of exact relationships between virial coefficients and intermolecular interactions. So let's think about such an interaction. If I have two molecules and they interact according to some potential energy function, and that potential energy function depends only on the distance separating those two molecules. I'll call it R. And so I've illustrated here two, like, apparently they're monatomic species. Maybe it's a noble gas. They are separated by some distance R. If the energy of their interaction depends only on that distance, then B2V can be expressed as minus 2 pi times Avogadro's number, so 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd, the integral from 0 to infinity, and that integral is ranging over R. That's why it goes from 0 to infinity. So from overlapping particles, which probably is not a favorable situation, because R is 0, all the way out to infinite separation. And the argument of the integral is the exponential of minus U of R. So this is the potential energy function. It says, given a distance R, what is the energy? It could be positive if it's repulsive, it could be negative if it's attractive, but there's some functional form for that interaction. Divided by KBT, so what's KB? We'll see a lot more of KB coming up, for now I'll just name it, that is Boltzmann's constant, and it is a constant that when multiplied times T has units of energy, because you should never exponentiate anything that has units if you can avoid it, so we'd like this whole thing to be unitless. If this is energy and here's temperature, then this must have units of energy divided by temperature. You can look it up if you'd like to in tables anywhere. For now, we'll just call it a constant. That entire exponential, minus 1, all quantity multiplying r squared dr. So where does u of r come from? Well, in principle, you could compute it using quantum mechanics. So given a gas, Maybe helium, that's a nice simple gas. We could put helium at various distances to helium atoms one from another, compute their energy of interaction, fit that to some sort of curve, your favorite curve, and that would define a function as a function of distance. Uh, it might not be so bad for helium, but more generally, such calculations can still be a challenging undertaking. A lot of observation indicates, though, that in a simple way, if you have two things interacting in general, that at very long range, there is an attractive interaction, not at infinitely long range. If you take two things too far apart, of course, they don't feel each other at all. But as they begin to come closer to one another and begin to feel one another, they interact with a 1 over r to the sixth dependence and a negative symbol here means it's attractive. So negative energy is downhill in energy. And there is some characteristic coefficient called the C6 coefficient, 6 because it's associated with the 1 over R to the 6th term, that dictates how large that attractive interaction is. And then meanwhile, as they get closer and closer and closer, sooner or later, these atoms with their clouds of electrons, the electrons start to interpenetrate these two clouds. That's a very bad situation. You get a whole lot of repulsion. That's why nuclear fusion doesn't happen spontaneously. And that repulsion is observed to go up as roughly the 12th power of the distance between the two species. So I'll express that then as a positive term, because it's repulsive, positive energy. C12, and again, the subscript just indicating it's on a power term that's 12th power inverse, over R to the 12th. And that is a repulsive term. And so just to see that this you know, really works, if R is getting very, very large, then R to the 6 is going to infinity, and so the attractive piece will go to 0. R to the 12th goes to infinity even faster. So uh, you're dividing by infinity. That goes to 0 at, at very large distances, no interaction. 
as they get closer and closer together, uh, the attraction turns on first, but then r to the 12th as I go closer to zero. So zero, a number near zero to the 12th power is much, much smaller than a number near zero to the sixth power. And so I'll be dividing by something much closer to zero in this term than in this term. And so the repulsion will overwhelm the attraction. So if I add them together, as I've sort of alluded to in my spoken discussion, I could write u of r, the potential energy function, is c12 over r12 to the 12th, that is, minus c6 over r to the 6th. So that kind of functional form was really first explored in a lot of detail by John Leonard Jones. And, it is ref and he wrote it in a slightly different way. We'll look at that in a, a moment. Uh, and it's called the Leonard Jones Potential. Generations of scientists have begun their careers believing that there was someone named Leonard and someone named Jones. In fact, that is not true. There was simply a single Leonard Jones. And so let's take a look at his equation in this case. It says that u of r is equal to 4 times epsilon times the quantity sigma over r all raised to the 12th power. So you see hiding in there the r to the 12th term in a denominator minus sigma over r. So same, same quantity, sigma over r, but now raised to the 6th power. So you see the r to the 6th hiding in a denominator. It's positive and negative in front of the 12th and 6th power terms respectively, as we saw previously. And the relationship then between the C12 and C6 coefficients and these new epsilon and sigma coefficients, those are shown here. So C12 is 4 epsilon sigma to the 12th, and C6 is 4 epsilon sigma to the 6th. If you graph this function, I've kind of alluded to it in words, but let's actually look at a graph of it. Defining the zero of the potential energy as being at infinite separation, and the units that I will graph on are reduced units, that is, they're unitless. So it's u itself, which would normally have units of energy, but epsilon has units of energy. And so I'm graphing this as u divided by epsilon. So as I come in, an attractive force first turns on, and I begin to go down, down, down. The form of the function is such that the bottom point of the well that's created by the attraction, then being balanced by the repulsion, is epsilon deep. And so epsilon over epsilon would be 1, and it's down, so it's at negative 1 on this plot, we see the bottom of the well. Then the repulsive force takes over, it crosses through 0 again, and where would that be? Well, when sigma over r is 1, 1 to the 12th is equal to 1 to the 6th, they're both equal to 1, I get 1 minus 1 is 0. So I should plot, actually, r divided by sigma. So again, a reduced distance expressed in units of sigma, if you will. So sigma has units of distance, and at r over sigma equal to 1, that's where the potential crosses back through 0, and then it rises again steeply. So uh, that functional form has some other interesting properties that allow you to look at other critical points. I think let's pause for a moment, and I'll let you play a bit with the equation and perhaps identify another one of those interesting points. Well, we've had a chance to look at some specific parameters before, and some parameters have had more intuitive feel than others. So A and B parameters for the van der Waals equation of state, for instance, not necessarily speaking obviously to people, at least not necessarily to me. Uh, and then there was B2V, which had a very clear and intuitive explanation having to do with volume. Happily, the Leonard Jones parameters are generally reasonably intuitive as well because they have units that we think in, energy and distance. So let's take a look at some tabulated Leonard Jones parameters for various gases. And I've got here all the noble gases up through xenon as well as three diatomics, hydrogen, nitrogen, and oxygen. So here are the epsilons, and actually in this case expressed in units of temperature because we've divided by Boltzmann's constant, but still it's sort of the variations that are interesting. And so what we see is that the well depth is a way to think about this, right? The epsilon told you how far down does attraction take you in the potential, is only 10 Kelvin, in, for helium, 
then 36 for neon, 120 for argon, 164 for krypton. By the time we're up to xenon, 229. So it's 23 times roughly as attractive to bring two xenon atoms together than it is to bring two helium atoms together. And that's consistent, actually, with what we know about the properties of the noble gases. So the polarizability, we'll actually see this in a little more physical detail soon, but the polarizability of the huge xenon atom with all its electrons leads to favorable London forces between the two atoms, or a dispersion it can be called, or induced dipole, induced dipole, so that they can attract one another. In helium, that's present, but to a much lesser degree, and so you don't get a very deep well. In the diatomics, hydrogen is least attracted to itself, nitrogen by more, and oxygen by more. So the oxygen well depth is deeper than the nitrogen well depth. Oxygen molecules are more attracted to one another. Sigma, which is here uh, tabulated in picometers, can be thought of as a measure of molecular size. And so not surprisingly, as we go from helium to neon all the way down to xenon, the noble gases get bigger. They get a whole lot more electrons and, and their valence shells expand. And then hydrogen being formed the lightest element compared to the other two diatomics is smaller than the other two diatomics. Nitrogen and oxygen are quite close to one another. I'm not sure I want to interpret tw a 12 picometer difference in this case. Suffice it to say, they're similar size. Well, I want to take a closer look now. I alluded at, uh, at the outset that the virial expansion is interesting because there is a relationship between the potential energy between two particles and virial coefficients. And I showed you the relationship that B to V was equal to this integral. Well now, instead of having a generic function U, we've actually got a specific function to play with, the Leonard-Jones potential. So let's insert the Leonard-Jones potential. So this is a, a little bit of an exercise in equation drawing, which can be an enjoyable exercise. Uh, I'm going to replace ur over kt. I'll replace ur with this. So here you see it. I've got the exponential. My minus sign is still in there, minus ur. So I put in a minus. The 4 epsilon is going to be over kbt. Here it is, 4 epsilon over kbt. They all multiply this quantity in brackets. It's still in there. Minus 1, all times r squared, dr. That's an imposing looking equation. It's got a whole lot of Greek letters and other letters. Let's simplify it a little bit at least, just to work with. And in particular, let me define T star. So T star is going to be Boltzmann's constant times temperature divided by epsilon. So notice what I've done. This is a little bit like a reduced unit in a way again, because I've divided by something that's specific to a given gas. Every gas has its own epsilon. So I'm going to take temperature and I'm going to transform it to T star in a substance sensitive way. But in any case, from a substitution standpoint, that means this E over KBT just becomes 1 over T star. So that'll simplify the expression. And then let me replace, make, make this substitution of X is equal to R over sigma. So here I have sigma r, sigma over r, so I'll take the inverse of that to get r over sigma, so I get all these x to negative powers. There also out here was an r squared and a dr, so if I rethink about this, r is equal to sigma times x. So I would replace this r with a sigma squared x squared. Sigma squared is a constant. Let me pull it out here. And there was another sigma that uh, we'll see the other sigma in a minute. So I've got a sigma squared out here, and if r is equal to sigma times x, then dr is equal to sigma times dx. So I'll leave the dx here, and I'll bring that other sigma out front. So that's why there's an appearance of a sigma cubed here. So now I have minus 2 pi, sigma cubed, Avogadro's number, integral from 0 to infinity, e of something that looks, I mean, it's not a friendly integral by any means, but it certainly looks cleaner. I've got simple powers of x, and I've got an x squared and a dx. Well. You won't look this integral up in a table, it turns out. It needs to be solved numerically, but it can be solved numerically. And I'm just reproducing it here on this slide. I want to do one last thing to it, though. I want to introduce the other necessary reduction, creation of a reduced unit, by getting rid of the other molecularly specific term that still appears. 
So there's still a sigma here. And remember, sigma is substance specific. So let me define b star to v. And in this case, it is a function of t star. So I'll have a reduced argument that is a function of a reduced property. Uh, and I will define b to, b to v star is b to v. And we'll get rid of this kind of ugly term out front, 2 thirds pi sigma cubed Avogadro's number. So that puts the substance specificity into b to, to b star. So I'll call that a, and, and notice incidentally, keep in mind that sigma had units of distance. So if I have distance cubed, that's like a volume. So to the extent this is substance specific, it can be thought of as equivalent to a, a characteristic molar volume. And that finally simplifies the expression as b star 2v function of t star is equal to minus 3 and this same integral expression we've seen previously. Now the reason I did this, why did I go through this long derivation of what looked like a complicated integral? Well, it gives rise to a pretty interesting additional law of corresponding states. You expect to find corresponding states here because I've built all the molecularity into the reduced variables. So I can measure B2V of T star. I do it as a function of T and then I look up epsilon and I turn all my T's into T stars. And then I just divide by 2 thirds pi Avogadro's number sigma cubed because I've looked up whatever sigma is. And I will now plot B2V star against T star. And you get this plot, where once again, there are a whole bunch of different symbols on there, a little bit small maybe. I don't know if they all show up perfectly. There's crosses, there's circles, there's squares. All gases fall on the same curve. And remember that the Leonard-Jones parameters themselves are determined from experimental B2V values. Right? So this is a, a universal property of the gases, if you will. It's, once more, it's not that it's just some fitting game that somehow gave rise to that. I also want to call your attention to an interesting feature. This is B2V star. It has this molar volume deviation from ideality interpretation. So at T star about 3.2, all gases pass through B2V star equal to zero. That is, there is no difference between their molar volume, their real gas molar volume, and the ideal gas molar volume. They behave ideally. So that temperature, which is called the boil temperature, is an, an interesting temperature for a given gas. It is the temperature at which the real gas behaves as though ideal. Now, it's different for every gas, because remember, T star has built into it actual temperature and the molecular property epsilon. But you can look up those epsilons and hence derive at what temperature would you expect an individual gas to behave in an ideal fashion. So that's a kind of a fun temperature to work at because you've got an ideal gas even though you have no right to an ideal gas. It's a real gas. Well, that's the, the last law of corresponding states we'll look at for a little while. Uh, in the next lecture in the series, what I do want to take a look at, the Leonard-Jones potential is, is interesting and useful, and we've seen its ability to uh, predict interesting things about corresponding uh, states of gases, but I want to consider some other intermolecular interactions as well. So we'll take a look at the physics behind them and maybe some functional forms. And in addition, before doing that, I'll recall for you, when we looked at the values of epsilon for diatomic gases, I called to your attention that oxygen has a larger epsilon than nitrogen. That is, oxygen is more attracted to other oxygen molecules than nitrogen molecules to other nitrogen molecules. You might imagine, I haven't necessarily proved it for you, but you might imagine that that attractiveness would have some influence on boiling point. So the less attracted gas molecules are to each other, the lower the boiling point. So the implication would be that molecular nitrogen should boil lower than molecular oxygen, or if we're moving the temperature in the other direction, that molecular oxygen should liquefy as we cool things down 
faster than gaseous nitrogen. So that can lead to an interesting demonstration, actually. Let's see if we can maybe make a little bit of liquid oxygen and determine what interesting properties that substance might have. So we'll do a demonstration, and then we'll come back to these other intermolecular potentials. As our study of real gases has progressed, we've discussed various properties of gases and how they vary by composition. The two most common gases in our planet's atmosphere are nitrogen, N2, at 78%, and oxygen, O2, at 21%. Nitrogen has a boiling point of 77 Kelvin, while oxygen has a boiling point of 90 Kelvin. Thus, at liquid nitrogen temperatures, we would expect oxygen to condense from the air. Let's actually do that. I'm going to fill this can with liquid nitrogen. The steam you see as I'm doing this is actually water vapor from the air condensing into water and ice from the cold of the nitrogen. But we won't worry about that. As the can cools down, it's going to reach a temperature on the outside, it already has, of 90 Kelvin, at which point oxygen in the atmosphere begins to condense onto it and rolls down to drip into this styrofoam cup, which is sufficiently insulating that we should be able to collect enough to play with if we wait for a little while. As I tip this for the camera to record, you can see its pale blue color. Oxygen also has a magnetic moment because of the unpaired electrons in the molecule. And if I dip this magnet into the liquid, do you see how the drops cling to the magnet? However, Let's consider whether being blue and paramagnetic is sufficient proof that this is liquid oxygen. How else might I convince you that I'm not fooling you and I've really condensed just a lot of liquid nitrogen instead, perhaps by using an even colder liquid in the can? Well, one thing oxygen does is support combustion. And while it's only 21% of the atmosphere, in this liquid, it's ostensibly pure. So, I wonder what would happen if I were to dip this salad crouton, toasted bread, into the liquid oxygen and then touch a flame to it. Shall we try? Wow. That crouton burnt with a vengeance, didn't it? That's the effect of having so much oxygen immediately available. Even if you believed me right from the beginning, that was certainly a fun way to further prove the chemical nature of the condensed gas. The difference in boiling points for nitrogen and oxygen derives from their different intermolecular interactions. While ideal gases by definition do not have such interactions, real gases do, and we'll be studying how those interactions affect gas behavior in detail using various quantitative models.